Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Jim Myers. I'm the Associate Provost for International Education and Global Programs at RIT. I just want to uh, thank everybody who's joining us and, and thank all of the presenters uh, who will be presenting throughout the week. Um, this is a sort of a first of its kind kind of effort to um, showcase the work that RIT faculty, uh, RIT students, RIT staff are involved in in Africa. Um, and uh, we'll be doing four of these this week, uh, throughout the week, um, and we hope you'll join us um, for all of the all of the presenters. Um, and today we have a presenter, uh, Fazil. Am I saying that correctly? Fazil uh, Said Wamwala. I'm sorry. Let me say that again. Wamalwa. So I apologize. Um, and uh, he is PhD in sustainability in the Galasano Institute for Sustainability. Uh, he's going to be talking about the economics of microgrids and groundwater fed irrigation. Um, this sounds like really fascinating work, and I'm looking forward to hearing more about it. Um, so, Fadil, it's all it's it's all yours. So, thank you very much for doing this for us today. Thank you for very much, James, for the for introduction. Yes, and to the attendants, welcome to our first day of presentation of our research that focuses on uh, the work that uh, goes on in the African continent in our school. My name is Fazil Omalwa. I think James introduced correctly. Yes, and uh, my work is uh, that uh, I will be talking about uh, this afternoon is on the economics of mini grids with small scale irrigation in sub-Saharan Africa. This work has uh, been, uh, is an ongoing work that uh, is being advised by Nathan Williams and uh, Jorge Tenorio is based at Carnegie Mellon University. Okay, thank you. Uh, in, this, the, in this work, we seek to explore the pathways to universal electricity access in sub-Saharan Africa. And this majorly is informed by uh, the current status of uh, sub-Saharan Africa when we compare with the, 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 the whole world. And uh, we will be speaking to this in the next few slides. The general research question that we seek to answer in this work is uh, looking at the impacts of integrating electricity use in agricultural value chain activities in electrification planning and technology development deployment in sub-Saharan Africa. Like uh, in a sense, we are looking at whether the use of electricity in agriculture can enable deployment or economics of infrastructure develop, deployment for electricity access or also the opposite that uh, whether the electricity access can actually enable agricultural productivity in sub-Saharan Africa. And then the specific question we are seeking to answer is what is the impact of electricity use or integrating electricity demand for small-scale irrigation farming on the economics of mini-grid deployment in sub-Saharan Africa? So the research background is informed by the five listed points. The first one being low electricity access in sub-Saharan Africa as compared to other regions of the world. And the second is the low human development indices. And an example is low per capita in sub-Saharan Africa as compared to other parts of the world. And then uh, the third is that uh, currently most of the centralized grids in the region are loss making. There are both technical and economic reasons for that that we'll be speaking to in this work. And then uh, the population demographics of sub-Saharan Africa being largely rural is not viable to electrify using grid extension. And this, we will also be talking about this, majorly informed by the fact that uh, rural population will be sparsely distributed over large geographical expanse, and uh, mostly for the sub-Saharan African continent and like any other part of the world, like a urban settlement will have a higher electricity demand than rural settlement. And this, because of the, the fact that sub-Saharan Africa is largely rural, low electricity demand makes the, and also the fact that infrastructure like distribution network will cover very large geographic expanse to reach a, a significant number of people, that makes it cost prohibitive 
And as a result, perhaps of grid electrification might be an option to explore. This is what we are looking at. And uh, this is just uh, a snippet of some of the thoughts that informs our work. Like uh, this looks at the relationship or the correlation between uh, energy per capita and uh, GDP per capita. As you can see that uh, most of the African countries or Africa as a continent, the countries in that part of the world are clustered around the origin here, characterized by low GDP per capita and low energy per capita. So this, we have questions as to whether low electricity access is a, one of the contributing factor to low GDP per capita or whether whether the low electricity access uh, or whether the low electricity or low, uh, low GDP per capita measured by low purchasing power is actually the reason for low electricity access. So the interplay between the two. We want to see whether enabling one can enable the other, like enabling economic well-being of the people, can that enable electricity access? Or enabling electricity access, can that enable economic well-being of the people? So this is one of the things. And then uh, this graph just gives a background to our work. Like here, looking at on the left-hand side of here, we see that these are coming from International Energy Agency projections. Like looking at the graphs between the year 2000 and 2016, you see that uh, all the regions of the world, developing regions of the world were having a negative gradient in terms of the number of people who, who would not have access to electricity. Meaning that actually in, in progression with the time, there is a decrease in the number of people without access to electricity. But Southern Africa is unique in the sense that between the year 2000 and about 2015, actually the population of people living without electricity was increasing until about 2015 to 2016, there was a small decline. And then looking at the right-hand side, we see that uh, when we project to 2030, the projection shows that actually the best Sub-Saharan Africa will hope for is actually to attain 60% electricity access, meaning that by 2030, we still will have up to 40% of the population living without electricity access. And the bar graphs here shows those proportions like between 2016 and 2030, you see that the numbers are stuck. The projection shows that the, electric, like the proportion of people who will not have electricity actually will slightly increase between 2016 and 2030. And this is majorly informed by the fact that the rate at which we are electrifying the population is less than the rate at which the population is growing. So this then has informed some of the thoughts in our research that we need to reappraise the current approaches to electrification. And uh, perhaps just to give a snippet that mostly arguing that we should just rest towards connecting people to the grid. And then the question is, is that really sustainable or is just that connection for the sake of it, is it really sufficient? And then this, this slide also speaks to the role of one of the technologies we are looking at, that is the mini grid or community-based microgrids. Now, this one, it is showing that if we look at the case, one of the case scenarios that have been uh, projected by International Energy Agency, that is electricity access for all by 2030. If we have to go by that scenario and ensuring that everyone will have electricity access by 2030, this graph shows that uh, mini grids, which uh, mini grid will be, will play a very significant role like enabling access, like in, this is in terms of investment, that uh, this looks at the least cost technology deployment, that between the grid, the mini grid and off grid systems. This, in this case, off grid, we are referring to some other off grid like standalone home systems or nano grids, which mostly are rooftop installments for a single homestead. So we are arguing that community-based mini grids will actually be the most, with the, the most viable least cost electrification pathway that will require the highest investment if we have to achieve universal electricity access. This is a projection basing on 2017 as the base year and looking into 2030. And this just to show the description of that, that uh, of the mini grid technologies, the solar mini grid, the solar PV 
technology will be the most viable as compared to other like hydro fossil fuels and uh, maybe wind and wind this looks at uh, especially in uh, developing countries which fall uh, along the like mostly developing countries in which more fall along the tropical climates like sub-saharan africa majorly looking at is a solar is uh, we have uh, a very high natural abundance of solar as compared to wind and hydro so therefore investing in solar will be the least cost and most viable technology option that will account for 48 percent of the cost of investment required for universal electricity access by 2030. And then the last part of uh, the of the of the introduction is looking at uh, the because we are looking at the nexus between electricity access and rural and uh, agriculture or agricultural production in sub-Saharan Africa. This one takes a look at uh, the current status of agricultural production in sub-Saharan Africa. When you look at uh, this left-hand side graph, which is a research done by Deutsche Bank Research 2014 shows that uh, that the agriculture actually on average contributes to up to 30 percent on average to the region's gdp and in some countries you see like sierra leone like chad like ethiopia and drc actually it's in excess of 40 percent meaning that agriculture is the most important the economic activity in those countries and uh, then on the right hand side, it shows uh, a stark difference between uh, the significance of aggregate and economic econo and economies of these countries and uh, the investment in terms of enhancing agricultural productivity. When you look at sub saharan Africa compared to other countries, and most importantly, other developing countries like regions like India here, you see that uh, between 1970 to 2014, there was there is some significant growth in uh, agricultural productivity of China and India. But when you compare that with Sub-Saharan Africa, you see that uh, it's, there is a stark difference there, that Sub-Saharan Africa is pretty flat, that there is no growth in agricultural productivity. Showing something that raises question here, that if agriculture is that important as shown by the graph on the left-hand side, then something ought to have been done about it because it is important. But when you look at it, there is no much that has been done in enabling agricultural productivity. And therefore, this raises some of the questions we'll be seeking to answer that. If we enable agricultural productivity in Sub-Saharan Africa, could that be one of the ways of enabling infrastructure development deployment for rural electrification? Then after that, we want to look at the symbiotic relationship between electricity access and agricultural productivity. And some of the hypotheses we seek to explore in our work is those two. That is the first one is agricultural production requires energy access or in electricity in this case in both primary and post harvest value chain activities like maybe milling or any post harvest processing activities like probably coal storage and such. Now we are saying that electricity access can unlock potential for, for agriculture, can unlock agricultural potential. An example is to argue and say that, uh, well, despite uh, low productivity, there is a lot of wastage, post harvest wastage because of uh, lack of coal storage. Maybe argument is if we enable coal storage, we might reduce post harvest losses. And when we reduce post harvest losses, then that we enable well being of the farmers. And therefore, we're arguing that electricity access will actually probably reduce post harvest loss, that is in post harvest. And then at primary production, maybe use of electricity for electric for small scale irrigation farming can enable increased production and as a result enable economic well being of farmers. Then the second hypothesis is that uh, electricity use in agricultural value chain activities has potential to raise the required electricity demand for viable viable technical and economic deployment of utilities and. This one, we are arguing that uh, currently in Sub-Saharan Africa, the deployed utilities, that is the grid and off-grid technologies like mini grids are struggling because of low electricity demand. And therefore, argument, argument is that if we increase electricity use in agricultural value chain activities, 
the increased demand will enhance viability of those technologies are that is grids and uh, mini grids so this is some of the hypotheses we'll be seeking to answer in our work so this this slide shows uh, some of the value chain activities we have mapped out well across the value chain that is from primary production to secondary processing you we first at this scope of work we are looking just at primary production uh, in this work that i'm presenting we will just look at primary production and majorly looking at uh, at irrigation farming that is water energy energy for water pumping for irrigation and this one just looking at some of the sources of input energy now like generally we'll have electricity as a source of energy we'll have some where we have diesel generators majorly in sub-saharan africa where people are doing some sort of small scale irrigation they're using diesel generators and uh, then there are cases of people using mechanical human labor and such a case looking at if we bring such we make we mechanize such case where people are using human labor and then we mechanize and electrify such then we are trying to look at the latent energy demand in such activities, whether such latent demand, if brought into electrification planning, can enable infrastructure deployment. So this is the schematic layout of our modeling process of work that has been accomplished in this work. And as you can see here, we have a, a, mo a, a model that is having two sub models are interconnected by a pump in the middle. The first model is a, a biophysical crop model basically this model takes in climate variables and uh, there are crop physiology that is the crop growth characteristics and a crop calendar and the soil characteristic of a given site or a given geographic location and then it simulates the crop water requirement and yield for that particular crop of interest and then from the biophysical crop model, first, just to mention that in this case, we will be simulating for a 10 year period, simulating daily yield and crop water requirement for 10 years on a daily basis. And then we average over 10 years to mitigate in the, in the annual variability because rainfall varies spatially and also varies in time. Sometimes there are years of lean rainfall and years of abundance rainfall. So for purposes of ensuring that our results captures average of the variability of variability over time the variables i mean the yield or the the indices i'll be reporting will be based on crop yield averaged over a 10-year period and then the next the second half of the model or sub model looks is a microgrid or a mini grid model and first the output of the the output of the biophysical crop model here is the crop water requirement and yield, but I'll be checking the crop water requirement to run this one into a pump model. And our focus in this is looking at groundwater fed irrigation. So in this case, we are pumping water from underground and we are relying on the British Geological Survey database as a source of data for the depth to groundwater table. So taking a geographical location, we estimate the depth to groundwater table there, and then use that depth to groundwater to compute uh, the dynamic head of the pumping system. And then using these two equations, the first equation can be used to us to estimate the energy requirement. In this case, energy requirement per day, because crop water requirement here we are looking at per day basis. And then the second equation can be used to look at the just the size of the pump for that matter. And those two equations, like the size of the pump, is important in sizing the infrastructure. The infrastructure in this of the mini grid. In this case, we have to size a mini grid component uh, component in such a way that they are, they are able to provide the required capacity to meet the irrigation water requirement per day basis. And then, once we estimate the energy requirement and the pump rating, we use those parameters to size the component of the mini grid. In this case, we'll be looking at a hybrid main grid that has got the solar PV, a diesel generator, and a battery storage. And then you now the microgrid we are talking about in this work has got two, two, two types of loads. The first load is a residential load, and then the second load is an irrigation load, which is coming from the, from the biophysical model here. The argument we are arguing in our work is that uh, deployment of mini grid based on residential electricity demand is not viable because of the low electricity demand 
And that is part of the reasons why the current mini grid deployed in the Sub-Saharan Africa are not viable without uh, grants and subsidies. So we are arguing that the enabling, if we raise sufficient electricity demand and we enable people's capacity, ability to pay for that demand, there will be sufficient demand to enable sustainable deployment of mini grids without necessarily relying on subsidies and grants. And therefore, in this case, we bring in another load which is coming from irrigation that will increase the load demand in this case. Now, these two loads are having different resolutions. The pumping load is having a daily resolution, but then the mini grid load will be having an hourly resolution. This enables us to model the two loads in such a way that the, 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 the model will seek to answer, uh, to, I mean, to meet the daily, the hourly load demand of the residential load profile, while the, the, the irrigation load will be modeled flexibly in such a way that we have a daily budget of energy requirement to meet irrigation demand. So, so that the model will, will look at available resources between the diesel generator, between the battery storage, and between the solar PV to look at which of the three is the least cost that can minimize the overall, mm, overall operation of the model so that it flexibly schedules irrigation to happen or take place any hour of the day that will be least cost. That is how we are modeling this. And then the output of the, of the technical model of the mini grid goes into a financial model. And this one, we look at the price of fuel and the exchange rates and then the energy tariffs. Then we compute the performance indices of the model. And this one, we'll be looking at uh, something like net present value of invest of or net present value of financial flows or cash flows, the internal rate of, of return, and then things like levelized cost of energy to look as matrix of performance of the model. And please, just to correct here, I've seen an error here. This H is supposed to be lowercase in the equation for the pump. This is the peak sun hours. So if we check, we check the average peak sun hours of our location where we are. We are studying. We divide the energy per day by the peak sun hours able to get a sense of this, of the of this rating of the pump. Then that will suggest that uh, the rating of the pump will vary spatially because uh, the peak sun hours changes with geographic location. Then we will apply our work to a case study here, and the case study looked at uh, uh, in this case we are looking at a rural village in Ethiopia called Huluku. This the, this, the choice of the, of the village is because of the available complete data that we can look at. And most importantly, is because uh, we had a, a, an access to data as an external consultant to some of the modeling activities because the site is here marked for, for, for piloting uh, small scale irrigation farming as anchors of or mini grids in Ethiopia. So this place, this, this, this is a village that has a uh, small farms, farms, 200 farms. And uh, of the 200 farms, they have uh, some 64 of those small farms are currently having diesel generators for irrigation. And then average farm size is about 0 0.3 hectare. And then they have about 45, 45 diesel generators which are shared among farmers who are doing some irrigation. And the main source of water is groundwater. And the principal crops grown there is onion and tomatoes. So we'll be looking at the economics of those two crops in our modeling to see whether actually it's viable, it's viable to, to consider deploying the infrastructure based on irrigation as an anchor and not a residential electricity demand. So this village has got 220 households. So in our model, we'll be modeling electricity first, the residential electricity demand for the 200 households, and then we'll consider just an estimate of 24 hectares of land that we can we consider can be subscribed to the mini grid from the available land available in that in that community uh, via subscription for irrigation. I mean that uh, a, a, a random number of farmers will take an, an just an estimate that a random number of farmers can each season subscribe up to two hundred uh, up to twenty four hectares of land available for for irrigation. We just pick twenty four because. Uh, Field 24 hectares is significant load to bring to the main grid after we trial out some 
some lesser land size than that. So this is the sum of this is a this is the output of our this is the output of of our biophysical crop model. We model a day the water requirement of of those five crops, and this is the plot of the crops. First of all, we modeled the crops in two seasons. We call one season A and one season B. Season A, we fix the planting date on the 15th of January. And the crop runs up, the three crops <coughs> runs up up to about 150th day of the year. And then we have a, we have a lay period of about one and a half months. Then we have season B, which we planted crops are on the 15th of July. And then it runs up to sometimes the beginning of February of, of December there. So this, we are using something called gro growing degree days where the growth of the of, or the, the harvest season is not fixed using calendar days, but fixed by the growing degree days, which depends on the temperature that the crop accumulates before from planting debt to the to the to the to maturity before it's harvested. Therefore, it, we are able to stack two crop calendars in a single fiscal year. That's planting on the 15th of January and harvesting of all the three crops, of all the four crops seem to have to happen between the beginning of June up to mid, up to end of June. And then we have a break of one period. Then we can plant either on the same piece of land. We attempt we, on the same piece of land or we can we, we assume a run, another random number of four farmers will subscribe for the same piece of land at 24 hectares for the same, to grow the same crop. But this is just per hectare water requirement, as can be shown that of the four crops, of the five crops, the crop that requires the highest amount of water is maize. And therefore we will use maize to size infrastructure, assuming that a well-sized infrastructure should be able to, get, to take care of water requirement of all the crops. Show me if you size an infrastructure using a crop that takes in less water requirement, like an example of, of tomato, which is green here, it will mean that such infrastructure may not be able to raise sufficient capacity to grow a crop that require high water requirement like maize. So we'll use maize for sizing purposes. This one on the left-hand side shows the, it shows the, a, a, a load profile that we have developed for 220, Households in the village we are studying called Kuluku. The load profile is developed as a typical load profile from some of the ongoing research in Sub Saharan Africa. Majorly, particularly this one, I used a tool from NREL. It's called Microgrid Load Profile Explorer that has been developed using a real data that has been collected from the field of the currently deployed mini grids in Sub Saharan Africa. The load profile looks like that, that the, the peak at the end of the day with low demand from midnight to about 10 a.m. in the morning. Then on the right, right hand side, I have the load profile of, I uh, picked out the, the maize crop that we are going to use to size the, the infrastructure. In this case, I've said that we picked two season, season A, Planting date of the first of the 15th of January and season B planting date 15th of, of July. So as you can see, season one, season A is the one that has got the peak requirement of water happening about, about what about the 60th day, month of February. So this is info gives us an information that uh, that uh, the, the driest part of the year happens for that particular village happens in the first half of the year. So when we size the infrastructure, we have this. First, we size the infrastructure for residential low demand. That is sizing the infrastructure based on the, on the load profile I have here on the left-hand side. And then the second, irrigation based, this one, we size the infrastructure just for meeting the, 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 the electricity requirement for irrigation farming. The logic here is that uh, we argue that because the irrigation load is flexible and we are using it as an anger load, we will not size the infrastructure to meet the uh, as uh, based on the combined residential and irrigation load. Instead, we'll size the infrastructure based on irrigation load 
and then we we run the model in such a way that is supposed to flexibly seek an optimal solution of 100% reliability meeting the two loads profile meeting the two loads so it will flexibly seek to meet the irrigation load at the low at lowest cost uh, both the the cost the 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 the, 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 the load demand the load profile at the lowest cost possible but one a residential i said is resolved hourly but irrigation load is resolved daily so this is the modeling framework that we are using this is just a schematic layout of the model i have i've just indicated here power flows using p1 to p5 like pc in this model and this is schematic pc denotes uh, the pc denotes a uh, curtailed power p1 is the power flow from the pv solar pv to the to the battery that is charging power and then p3 is the power flow from the pv mode from the pv mini grid to the to the from the solar pv i mean to the irrigation load demand and then p2 from the solar pv to the residential load demand and then a diesel generator, we are modeling a set of generators so that uh, because diesel generator should operate in such a way that uh, we maximize the capacity factor. I, I mean, the load factor. So in this case, we are the minimum load factor should be, we are using 30%. So therefore we are having, a, in our case, we model just three generators. So. There is one, two, three generators. So in that case, that at any one time, the power flow from these generators could be the optimal combination of those three generators depending on the load demand at that particular hour. And then there is, at any time, we can either discharge the battery to meet the load demand of either residential or irrigation. There could be argument about the economic, the technology of running the, the pump using a battery. But in this case, we are actually subjecting to a model to make the to give the model the flexibility to make decision because we are seeking to maximize the gain, maximize the profitability from the sale of electricity for both residential and, electric, and irrigation demand. In this case, an example, the power flow from the PV P2, the power flow P2 and P3 have got a, a tariff. This person is selling electricity, make money from there. And then we look at the battery degradation cost on a power flow P4 and P5, whether it makes sense to drain the battery to sell electricity for running the pump and meeting the residential demand or whether the battery degradation cost will be higher than the gain. So that is um, a decision making uh, that uh, an algorithm that runs our model makes decision on. And then this, we are formulating the problem as a constraint of transition problem that is solved in a in a in a in an environment called uh, STEM, that is stochastic techno economic microgrid deployment model, that was developed by one of the advisors uh, to this piece of work. the The model was developed specifically for assessing the technical and economic viabilities of our mini grids from an investor perspective. So we chose the model because we are approaching this from an investor perspective. We, the investors are not making money. So we want to see whether the, our logic argument that uh, anchoring mini grids on uh, irrigation will actually enhance financial prospect of the model. So we are seeing the model seeks to maximize profit from the sale of electricity or minimize the overall operational cost of the model. If I am seeking to sell electricity. My argument here is this: I should actually minimize sale of electricity from the. If it's on flat tariff, then I'm seeking to minimize the sale of electricity. For, I'm, I'm trying to maximize the sale of the cheapest electricity here. That's P1 and P, uh, P, P2 and P3, and minimize probably the use of diesel generator, diesel power. P3, I mean PG1, PG2, and PG3 because it has a fuel cost. When we formulate that problem, we have uh, the, 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 the cost function equation 11 here. Uh, the equations are not numbered logically here. It's just a snippet of the piece of, of, of work that uh, we are writing. So equation 11 is uh, the cost function. And the lambda here is, the, is, is a vector of tariffs, or rather a vector of uh, income. And then alpha is a vector of cost. Uh, just to give an example, if I may just uh, go back here, 
if you look at it like an example of PG3, PG3, it has lambda there is the is, is the tariff that the tariff at which I'm selling electricity to meet residential electricity demand, and then alpha is the cost of fuel associated with that power flow PG3. Now, therefore, taking the difference between the tariff that I'm selling electricity from diesel to the residential load minus the lambda at alpha, which is the cost of fuel, it gives me the, the, the marginal gain. And therefore, looking at that equation 11, it seeks to maximize the marginal gain. I mean, the gain, the, the gain of the difference between the two, because the difference between the cost and the, uh, the, the I mean, the tariff and the cost gives us a gain here. And then we multiply that gain by the power flows. So each of the power flows, P1, P1 to P5, uh, P1 to P, P, P1 to P5, and then uh, the power flow of the generators P, PG, PGM1 to PGM3. I mean, M is a, is a, is a, is a, is a, is a set of generators. It has, it has associated cost and associated tariff depending on where the power is flowing to. So these are the transition constraints of our model. Yeah, these models, some of the constraints are our hourly basis, like an example, constraint number 14. Our constraint number number 13 shows that the power flow P2, the sum of the power flow P2 and P4 plus the sum power, the power flow, the hourly power flow, or at any time T, the power flow P2 plus P4 plus the sum of the power from the combined set of generators should be equal to the residential load demand. In other words, the residential load demand will be met by the combination of those three power flows. And then the constraint number 15 is the sum. This one is the, we are saying that the, at any hour, at any time T, the power available from the diesel generators with the sum of the power flow from the three set of generators, are from the M set of generators. And then the power, like the constraint number number 17 is the constraint of the daily daily energy requirement, which we say we are modeling as, as a flexible demand. As you can see, showing that at any, like the sum of the power flows, P3, P5, and some of the power flow from the diesel generator will be equal to the daily energy demand of the, of, we are summing over 24 hours, should be equal to the, the daily energy budget for irrigation demand. And then the last nine, 19 is a, is, a, is, a, is a state variable. That is the constraint of the battery storage. At, at any one time, the battery is constrained to line between the minimum and the maximum. The minimum is constrained by the depth of discharge of the battery, and the maximum is when the battery is fully charged. In this case, we are, we are modeling using lead acid batteries. And therefore, the, the minimum is the minimum depth of discharge, which is 40% which is of the capacity. And then the maximum is when it's fully charged 100%. The preliminary results that we have for our model are here. This first, the results we show the power flows, the optimal power flows. First, we solved the mod, we solved the transition problem we have from here using a CVX pi, CVX, CVX pi as a, as a solver here. Well, we tested out a number of algorithms that can solve or solvers that can solve this but then turned out that the most uh, optimal in terms of uh, computational speed and ability to flexibly handle the problem as a mathematically formulated problem, the way it is without necessarily trying to customize the problem to fit the format of input to our solver. And also the fact that you can handle convex optimization problems turned out that the best optimal, I mean solver that we settle on for, we settle on, we settle on. So looking at this, this power flow shows, first of all, the, on the left-hand side, when we run a mini grid deployed, basically on, uh, uh, just specifically on residential load only, which we are arguing that uh, the mini grid that, that's deployed in sub-Saharan Africa based on this current, on this residential model, are actually struggling to make, uh, to make sense financial. When we run that model, it shows this kind of power flows that, uh, the solver seeks to meet the seeks to maximize the use of you, you see the solar PV, which is cheap to generate during daytime whenever it's available. So from midnight to about 6 a.m., it is going to meet the load demand using the diesel generator. And then during the day, 
it throttles down the diesel and battery and then meets the daily load demand using solar PV as long as solar PV is available. Then later on, at the end of the day, we see that uh, the solver seeks to optimally meet the load demand using the optimal combination of the battery and the diesel power. And then um, on the right, right hand side, we now look at the mini grid deployed based on irrigation load. We see on this one, I've just put up uh, the 24 hour power flows of the three of, of the two loads. We see the, here that the, the algorithm seeks to meet the load there because the irrigation demand is, is a flexible demand. The algorithm tries to fit, to meet the, the, the irrigation load demand during the day when there is, there is a, a cheap source of power that which is solar PV. And then early in the morning and late in the day, it seeks to meet the load demand. Uh, it, it, like, I mean, uh, okay, I mean, the, the irrigation demand is majorly met during the day, during the day, and minimally met at night and uh, early morning hours. And then this shows down. Um, the monthly energy flows from our model. Looking at the monthly energy flows, you see that, uh, like an example, for the residential mini grid, we see that uh, solar and uh, diesel were the major source of power. And uh, you can see that uh, solar was significant player in the month of January, February, March, April. And as long as the months when we have good solar insulation, you see that solar was a significant player. Then diesel comes in during the months when we have lower solar insulation for the site we are studying, like the month of June, the month of July, and the month of August. Remember this. Remember the the residential load is not flexible load. It has to be met at each hour. Therefore, you find diesel becoming a significant source because if there is no sufficient solar during the day and you have to meet our load demand for residential load, then we have to meet it using diesel or a battery, depending on whichever or optimal combination of the two, depending on which is the which combination gives the least cost. And then. For the for the mini grid deployed based on irrigation load profile, you see here that uh, the optimal combination of the two, that uh, residential, you see mini grid, uh, you see irrigation load actually being uh, the, the the major load in the month of February, the month of March, in the month of April, in the month of May, and also later on in the month of October and November. These six. This shows something that uh, actually the, the mini grid, I mean, the irrigation can be a main source of income for those particular months, which are roughly five months of the 12 months. And it's a significantly large load. Like if you look at the month of March, the month of April, and the month of May, October, November, the large energy requirement for, require, for, for irrigation can serve as an, a source of income for the mini grid during those months when uh, a source of income that can uh, like can boost the the economic outlook of the mini grid. And then in the financial modeling part, we we model uh, we we first of all modeling the even the technical part. These are just the, the the numbers that we used and the sources. The numbers the sources uh, these are just snippet snapshot of from the paper we are developing. But then I've put a point here that. Uh, where the cost is arranged, like solar PV is arranged, uh, like I mean for the like for the charge controller is arranged between 200 and 400, and where the lead acid battery is arranged between 300 and 500, we have used the the upper limit for the worst case scenario, because these are uh, these are parameters which uh, are variable, and uh, we will do sensitivity analysis around them to just have a sense that well, depending on the cost, depending on the parameter of sensitivity of the parameters, yeah, the outlook might look different. So to first of all, to first of all, determine as to whether it's necessary to do irrigation. First of all, we do irrigation productivity. Here we simulate crop yield for both uh, seasons and for two scenarios here, we look at rain fed production and irrigation production. This one, we want to see whether actually is, pro, pro, is, 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 is economically productive for a farmer to actually opt for irrigation. Because we can say we want to irrigate, but when it doesn't make sense, then it doesn't make sense. In this case, we run we, we, we run a biophysical crop model here. 
to generate uh, irrigation yield based on rain for, uh, to, to generate crop yield of those four crops that's maize, potato, onion, and tomatoes in both two seasons based on, in, in cases without irrigation. And then we get those yield. Then the second case, we do irrigation. You can see here, like if you take an example of tomato in season A, you see that uh, during rain fed condition, the pro productivity, like production is 29.4 tons per hectare. But in the same season, when we do irrigation is 58 tons per hectare. The, what is happening here is that uh, water is a limiting factor. And so when we grow these crops without sufficient water, what happens is that uh, there will be cases of uh, low yield as a result of low rainfall, or low, low water availability. And therefore, when we do now irrigation that we are providing water as a, you're providing water here as a source of, uh, as a, uh, I mean, irrigation to meet the deficit water requirement. So we get that that actually for the all for the all four crops we can see that irrigation actually leads to an increase in yield, and therefore the next then the next we compute the we compute the profitability of those yield, and yield in this case we are looking at the difference between rain fed, and uh, we look at the difference between rain fed and irrigation to compute the 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 increased yield as a result of irrigation. So the difference we look at the difference in the two. Like in this case, an example for the, 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 the increase in yield due to irrigation for tomato crop will be the in season A will be 58 minus 29.4. Now we look at the cost of production, which we have numbers, which we got like in this case, an example of tomato crop is $590 per hectare. And then the selling the farm gate price of tomato crop in Ethiopia from the sources we have is $140 per ton. We compute profitability in both season A and season B. What shows that season A is more profitable? This is mainly because delta Y, which is the increase in yield due to, due to the difference between irrigation and rain fed, is the highest season A because season A is drier season. Then we use this one. That yield, that profitability to compute a, a metric here, energy productivity, which is the dollar value of each unit of energy used for irrigation. We get these numbers showing that uh, the most Okay, the, this these columns in season A, which it shows that season A is the most, is the season where there's highest dollar value of each unit of energy used than season B. This then column, this column E, P, A, B is the average of the two columns, these two seasons. It shows that the most profitable or the energy productivity, the highest is tomato crop followed by, uh, by, uh, by potato and onion tying, and then uh, least is maize. This, we use this parameter to actually assess whether it's viable to set a given, a given, a given tariff. Like for example, if you are to buy electricity at a tariff of 0 0.6 kilowatt hour, which we are using uh, per kilowatt hour, which you are using in this work, it will be unprofitable to run a maize irrigation venture based on that because the energy cost, the, the, the energy cost is higher than actually the gain from each unit of energy you are generating. So in this case, this one helps us to determine that actually it's viable for the tariff we are going to. We are going to use a tariff of 0 0.6, which is the average tariff of the best run mini grid in Sub-Saharan Africa, 0 0.6 dollars per kilowatt hour. So therefore, for the three crop, for the three crop potato, onion, and uh, for the three crops potato, onion, and tomato, it means that it's viable for us to buy electricity at a price of 0 0.6 dollars per kilowatt hour because the gain in each unit of energy is far more than that. But then after we, we use that, we set that tariff of 0 0.6, then we try to compute the metrics of sale of our energy, and then we look at uh, other metrics like levelized cost of energy, which does not require the tariff. Levelized cost of energy for the residential mini grid turned out that it was uh, 0 0.5, and then the irrigation-based mini grid is 0 0.28, which is less, uh, almost half that implying that actually the increased electricity demand for, for irrigation has the impact of lowering the energy, uh, the, the cost of production of energy as a result it makes even the mini grid deployed based on irrigation load more competitive compared to, to residential in terms of providing cheaper electricity access to the region that is cost sensitive. And then look at the NPV values. We see that despite the high life, higher life cycle cost of the 
irrigation based mod model which has 168,000 as compared to 120. You see that the NPV turns out that it's actually higher for irrigation based mini grid as compared to the residential based mini grid. Then looking at the internal rate of return, we can see again that actually it's twice the rate of return for the irrigation based mini grid as compared to residential mini grid. Then lastly, we do some sensitivity analysis about around some parameters like the first one, look at the cost of capital. In our model, we use the cost of capital of 9%, which is, which is based on 2020, 2020 macroeconomic environment in Ethiopia. So using the, the discount rate, real rate of 9%, we were able to get around that, but because inflation rate varies with the time and also nominal rate also has, looking at the historical data of Ethiopia varies in time. Then we tried to simulate around uh, a variation of a discount rate between five and 20. And we can see that the mini grid deployed based on residential electricity demand. When the interest rate is, or the cost of capital is beyond 15%, it ceases to be profitable. It starts having negative NPV values, meaning that actually it's more sensitive. Rather, we say that uh, it is more sustainable to anchor mini grid on a, on a, on a, on, on, on irrigation load because it's, it's able to remain profitable in all the, 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 the interest regime between five and 20, which simulates the, the best and the worst possible scenarios here. Then we also ran a model, we ran it in the pivot around this fuel price. In our model, we used a fuel price of 0 0.62, which is the cost of average cost of fuel of diesel in Ethiopia, in Ethiopia around the year 2021. So when we range the price of fuel around 0 0.4 to $1.9 dollars per liter, we see that again, the mini grid deployed based on residential load ceases to be profitable at a, at a, at a rate of around, uh, around $1.5 per liter. Then lastly, it's also sensitivity around, around the sensitivity of internal rate of return and the levelized cost of energy on the cost of, electric, uh, on the cost of fuel we see that uh, when you look at the internal rate of return, because we use the uh, marginal rate of return of 9%, we see that when the price of fuel gets to something around 1.4 per liter, the IIR or internal rate of return falls below the marginal rate of return, meaning that it's no longer profitable to run that. Just in summary, it seeks to show that actually mini grid deployed based on residential load demand are more sensitive to variables like uh, the cost of capital are more sensitive to variables like the cost of fuel and most importantly they are less profitable and less sustainable and as a result even looking at the cost of the, the level of cost of production sub-saharan africa is a low income region as a result we seek to provide the lowest cost electricity possible and if the cost of production is average 0 0.5 per dollar it means that a residential mini grid will only make sense if we set capital we set the tariff above 0 0.5. But if we anchor such a mini grid on, a, on an irrigation load, we are able to have a lower production cost of 0 0.28. That gives us a room to be able to set actual a tariff that is a cost sensitive to the people, like a, a tariff of, of 0 0.5 of 0 0.6, which is the average of the region. We still actually generate a good outlook based on a, on a residential, on, on, on irrigation based mini grid. Therefore, our conclusion is that uh, it is much viable to anchor a mini grid based on irrigation or on a productive use of electricity, in this case, irrigation, than actually to anchor a mini grid on a residential low, a low demand uh, residential, residential electricity demand of the, of the pipeline. Okay, yeah. Thank you, thank you so much. Yeah. To, to thank you, sir. They know it's you're you're great, Fazo. Thank you. We do have just a couple minutes for questions. I have enabled microphones. If anybody would like to, um, please raise your hand uh, with the hand raising tool, and you can use your microphone to ask a question, or you could put it into the chat. Okay. Jim has a question. It's a very interesting presentation, really very interesting. And, and so uh, the 
detail and complexity of work that you've done is just really impressive. So I have to ask, what's the barrier then? Why why haven't farmers, if there's an economic rationale for for doing this, why haven't farmers pursued microgrids? Is it a collective action problem? Is it a a, a high upfront cost issue versus the diesel alternative? What what is it that's kind of the barrier? Um, yeah. Okay, thank you so much, Jules, for asking that question. Yeah, it's uh, one of the one of the of, of, of the of the of the challenges we have uncovered in our review is that uh, the the there is a like uh, the, the 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 policy environment mostly has not been viable for such, and the reason why we have sought to. To, to, to consider Ethiopia in our case study is because currently Ethiopia is trying to explore the interplay between uh, looking at the nexus between uh, deploying rural electrification infrastructure and guard on, uh, on, 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 uh, on irrigation so that they look at how to how to co the, the, the issue of uh, modernize the agriculture sector by enhancing uh, irrigation and then looking at whether such irrigation that irrigation demand can also enable electricity the de deployment of infrastructure in in location that will otherwise not be financially or economically viable to do so so i can agree i agree with you that is true that the uh, environment has not been viable to enable farmers to be able to to to, to exploit the benefit of actually considering irrigation as uh, to considering i mean energy for a mini grid for irrigation so is the is the current sort of is the is there an evolving policy framework that is so you said that they're trying to help develop irrigation infrastructure generally in Ethiopia um, is this has this been factored into their thinking the work that you're doing yes part of the what, what we are doing is to develop some sort of a, 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 a policy framework that uh, justifies that actually if an environment is if we create a policy environment that uh, can uh, look at uh, co-planning of uh, agricultural modernization and rural electrification, that is a viable environment for us to, to actually benefit the, from the nexus of the two. And Ethiopia will, will be a good case study because currently they are exploring that policy environment. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Do you want to be respectful of, of people's time? I know that we wanted to, to end at one, but if there are any final questions quickly, we I think we could take one more. Yeah, if there is any question, yeah. Hi, uh, could I ask a question? Please, Tony. Yeah, um, one of the results that you were showing seemed to be that, um, especially that the irrigation was much more effective for season A than season B. And I guess my question was really, is it, is it worth it to even do irrigation in season B? Yeah, thank you so much uh, for that question. Yeah, one of the, one of the, of the, of the, of the thoughts uh, we, we actually developed is uh, very consistent with what uh, you are you're asking is that uh, we one of the policy advice we look at is that um, while considering irrigation there is a season that is most cost optimal for irrigate to irrigate like mostly currently farmers are just relying on a single crop per season and mostly actually it's a season b because season b for the site just like i left out some of the information of the graph showing rainfall distribution for the site we are studying that the rainfall is much more in season B than in season A. So farmers tend to grow crops in season B because of, of sufficient rainfall. And then season A, there is a minimal production for a few can afford irrigation, mostly currently using diesel generators. So we are looking at the two that we can optimize and maximize crop production by having two cropping seasons. But because season A has got lesser rain, it becomes the most viable season for irrigation because it has lesser precipitation as a result, it will need more water. 
for irrigation. And when you look at even crop prices, normally just like use an average, an average price of farm gate price, but naturally look at crop, the price of crops, crops actually tend to be, the price tend to be optimal in seasons when there is low production and that is season, dry season. So therefore farmers will opt to, to, to irrigate if they advise actually season A is the best season because that season have got lesser production, they'll meet best market price of their crops, they'll have higher yield of crop per each unit of energy they'll be buying for electricity than in season B. Yeah. Thank you and great presentation overall. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anton. Thank you, Fazil. Um, I think with that, we will uh, conclude for the day unless um, I see any quick hands come up. But uh, Fazil, I, I thank you so much for starting us off with such a wonderful presentation in, in this first of the four part series. Um, please do register for our next three, which are tomorrow, Wednesday and Thursday. And, um, and hear from a number of other wonderful presenters who of our IT faculty and PhD students who are doing work in Africa. So thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful day. And thank you one more time, Fazil. Thank you. Much welcome.